Can you hear me okay? I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak today and Dr. Swain for sharing uh, the podium. Um, so uh, a lot of discussion today about point of decision, uh, a point of care decision support. So I'm just going to give you an example of what we've done at Vanderbilt, uh, just as a rep representative example of what can be done. So many of you may know that uh, cancer has been for more than 100 years really described uh, from where it came from uh, on the body as well as what it looks like under the microscope. But we know uh, really that at the genetic level, uh, many cancers can differ, especially in terms of what is so-called the driver mutation, i.e. the mutation that not only induces tumor genesis, but then is required for that tumor cell to survive. And so classically, melanoma, for example, has been described uh, where it, uh, it comes from on the skin. Uh, but now we know uh, from tumor profiling uh, at Vanderbilt, for example, and elsewhere that there's really uh, multiple subsets that are uh, clinically relevant. Um, at Vanderbilt, we've uh, initiated uh, routine tumor testing. We've tested over 2,100 specimens. And again, uh, a large fraction of these uh, patients' tumors will have specific driver mutations that are potentially actionable with targeted therapies today. And uh, as a result of the genotyping, 61% of those patients have gone on, in, on to a clinical trial, uh, specifically in melanoma, a big comparison to the 3% nationally uh, that go on. So the reason I think I'm talking to you today is because uh, there's a huge knowledge gap, uh, even in the oncology world, as to what to do with all these mutations. Uh, we built gene panels that only were testing for about 40 to 60 mutations, and even then some fellows and uh, staff at, our, uh, at Vanderbilt were having difficulty deciding what to do with those specific mutations. A lot of people have talked about this, but essentially there's surveys that reveal a disconnect in the understanding of and communication about genetic mutation testing among healthcare professionals and cancer patients. And so one of the things we did was first uh, to get rid of the old electronic medical record for reporting a gene mutation testing. Uh, as many of you may know, at, most, uh, at many hospitals, there's a scanned PDF from the molecular pathology lab that goes into the chart. It's very hard to find that report. It's also hard to uh, see where the result is. Uh, and the challenge for us was really how do you start to report multiple mutations in multiple genes at the same time? And whose role is to curate all of that knowledge? Uh, and there's no clinical trial information or therapeutic uh, implications for uh, the results. And so uh, at Vanderbilt, we uh, actually control our own medical record. It's called Star Panel, so we can adapt it. Uh, and in conjunction with Mia Levy, a very talented biomedical informaticist, uh, we've essentially uh, in put into the chart the, the results of uh, genetic testing uh, of our patients. Here in particular is a, a, a what we call a dashboard or a whiteboard where we can see by patient the exact mutations that were tested for in the specific melanoma panel. Uh, and then we put a lot of thought into saying what, what does a clinician really want to know? They just want to know positive or negative. Uh, so you can see if a yellow result is positive and a gray result is negative. If you really want to know the exact mutation, you hover over the yellow, and then it gives you specifically all the different kinds of mutations that you looked for. And you can see that a clinician at the point of care with five minutes to see an uh, her, his or her patient uh, could get very confused, uh, especially at the genomic uh, level of the significance of all these mutations. Now, again, I'm also a practicing oncologist. I know that you have five minutes sometimes to go see your patient. You want to just look it up. And, and be able to discuss in an intelligent manner. So within the chart, if you forgot what B600E is, you can just click on that, and it takes you to My Cancer Genome, which is a freely available website designed to enable a genetically informed approach to cancer medicine. Now, at this particular website, you can see very, in very brief detail, we wrote it, uh, or the mantra is that uh, a clinician should be able to catch up on all the information within five minutes. It will tell you, for example, the location of the mutation, the frequency of that mutation in melanoma, the frequency of the specific V600E mutation among BRAF mutant melanomas, and then the implications for targeted therapy. Um, in addition, uh, you can then, uh, uh, what we're most excited about is the, it can help you find clinical trials. And so if you click on the clinical trials tab, it will take you to BRAF mutation directed melanoma clinical trials, not only at Vanderbilt within our own system, but also in Tennessee, in the United States, and internationally. Uh, what Dr. Levy did was to download all of clinicaltrials.gov and then uh, using natural language processing and machine learning, uh, use gene names to search that and annotate it so that you can search the trials by gene status. And then if you click on specifically, for example, that number, it will take you to the clinical trial that's being done at Vanderbilt and you can check eligibility. Uh, you can click on the United States, and it will tell you uh, which sites around the world uh, in the United States particularly have trials uh, directed towards BRAF mutant melanoma. 
and then you'll take, click on the specific site, and it will take you to uh, nciclinicaltrials.gov. So again, this is a website that's designed to enable a genetically informed approach to cancer medicine called My Cancer Genome. We currently cover 17 cancers, 25 genes, and 289 disease gene variant relationships. We also have clinical trial search where you can search 36,000 cancer trials, 135 cancer diagnoses, and 437 cancer genes as defined by COSMIC, which is the catalog of somatic mutations in cancer rung by the Sanger. We want to be the COSMIC for clinicians. Uh, which is essentially not available except through this website currently in the world. Um, we also built something called Direct, which is the DNA mutation inventory to refine and enhance cancer treatment. We started with EGF receptor mutations in lung cancer and basically looked at all the papers since 2005 and have more than 1,000 patients in the database with 188 different kinds of EGF receptor mutations. Again, as a person who was involved in the discovery of EGFR mutations, I used to get emails all over uh, every week from people, I had my patient's tumor genotype that has this mutation, what am I supposed to do? Well, now they can just go to direct, uh, and then they can find out the significance of that particular mutation in EGF receptor. And we hope to expand that out. And actually, we think there should be a national or international effort with this kind of database so that we can actually keep track of all these rare mutations. We also built the uh, interest only complete list of targeted therapeutics, uh, which you can easily access on the website. And there are other edu educational uh, things on the website as well. Right now, this is a worldwide collaboration. It's, it's basically based on philanthropy and, and grants. Uh, we have 49 contributors from 18 institutions in eight countries. And we now, uh, starting about in, we started in January of 2011, and we're now more than, we now have more than 2,000 site uh, users per week, according to Google Analytics, uh, from 134 countries around the world and all 52 US territories. Uh, and then this slide is just to show you that it's a huge collaborative effort. Uh, we do have a lot of people at Vanderbilt, but our contributors are from all over the world, and we ask uh, experts throughout the world to help contribute on their specific disease and gene variants and mutations. Thanks. Great. All right. Thank you very much. So we have questions for um, our oncology colleagues. I think Mark is going to start off. Thank you. One comment um, uh, related to the uh, aggregation of data. Again, we've got a great example in oncology of how this can work. And that's the children's oncology group that, you know, for a variety of reasons, were faced with the challenges of rare tumors and, and uh, made the decision from the get-go to aggregate data. And, you know, uh, the number of children that are, that are on trials approaches 100%. Um, and so uh, it's, in some ways, I don't think we'll be able to scroll back and begin something like that, but it's certainly a worthy uh, goal. The question I have for you, uh, Bill, is um, tell me a little bit more about the outcome measures that you're using to uh, determine the uh, impact and effectiveness of the uh, MCG uh, program. Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, all we have is a user survey that people can ask us questions or give recommendations, et cetera. We've had multiple survey requests. Right now, the content is written for physicians, by physicians, and physician scientists. But we've had a lot of requests to translate it into patient-centric information. Um, we've also had, and I'll get to more your detailed question, but we've also had requests to translate it into Fran uh, French, German, um, and then other uh, medical institutes wanting to link to us or, and, or suck in the content so that they can report their outcomes. In terms of actually whether it's influencing patient care, we have not measured that specifically. Right now, we're trying to um, help clinicians and oncologists really use the genetic information. We know patients are getting their tumors tested. The bulk of mutations that are tested for include like V600E or actionable ones like an EGF receptor. Uh, where people do know what to do, but there are some rare ones where we, we don't have, there's no evidence as we've been discussing in terms of the guidelines. In, in terms and of I, th I think the reason, uh, you know, I wanted him to present it too is because we would like an ASCO to include these kind of things because our cancer link, one of the main goals is looking at outcomes for all these patients who are treated, you know, not just with genomic information, but information in general. Yeah, and, and one specific uh, question you, or uh, a point, you mentioned that 65% of your Vanderbilt patients are on trial. How much of that is attributable to this, or was that just a, a, a cultural uh, thing that predated uh, this? Yeah, so some of that involves the fact that, for example, in melanoma, we have lots of trials in, uh, that are genome-directed. And so I think there's a huge referral bias for patients to come and get specific care for their specific mutation. We have trials for all the different subsets of melanoma, for example. Great. 
Um, I'm wondering when you when you work with these cancer genomes, are you getting more information than the candidate genes, um, or or are you really just focusing on the the driver mutations in cancer? Yeah, so right now, at least at Vanderbilt, we're just focusing on the driver mutations, but we know there's, as other people have talked about, there's going to be large groups of people who are doing exomes or genomes, et cetera. Right now, the website is only designed to help you with a single mutation and a single gene and a single gene disease variant. Uh, so I think the next frontier will be how do you deal with multiple mutations. However, there are companies that many of you may know, for example, like Foundation Medicine, which profiles more than 200 cancer genes, full exomes, including multiple fusions, et cetera, and they give much more extensive reports, some of which our clinicians still have trouble interpreting if they're not necessarily um, pathway-oriented in terms of cancer biology. Yeah, one, one thing that you're, you'll probably be struggling with as well as everyone um, is, is how do you deal with the mutations that you find that are not related to oncology? So, so you know, you're dealing with, with cancer, but then there are all those, all those other findings. And so, so have, you, have you run across any of those yet, or are you, are you making plans to, to deal with other subspecialties? You want to describe that? Uh, sure. Well, in cancer, well, right, at Vanderbilt, we're only testing for known variants, but obviously everyone's moving towards full exome or uh, finding uh, variants of unknown significance. Right now, as Dr. Swain alluded to, at least in cancer, you can say there's a mutation for which there's an FDA-approved drug uh, and there's an indication in that specific disease. Then you may get a mutation like V600E in a colon cancer for which there's no FDA approval, but which there's FDA approval in a different cancer. And then, and you can move on down the chain, you know, then that's a mutation of signif clinical significance, but not necessarily in that disease. Then you move on to variants of unknown significance, et cetera. Um, I think a lot of us are wrestling with that fact. I was just reading the science paper coming over about how you can also re-identify patients um, <laughs> by all of that data. And I think we all have to grapple with that as we move towards these large databases. Great. Uh, Jean? For Dr. Swain, it seems to me, relative to the other subspecialties of medicine, you really have a challenging task because you're having to put this all together as tons of data rolls in. Um, are there lessons learned about how you've done that that could inform what other people are going to try to do to get ready for it before it hits? Well, I think that cancer link is the lesson learned, and we are just still we're continuing to learn lessons and the prototype is just being rolled out so we definitely will and we plan to publish a paper on it on the issues it's not been easy as you can imagine using all different electronic uh, medical records trying to get it all together getting um you know for my institution for example which is medstar the lawyers are not excited would be an understatement about giving information to a company to anonymize. That's a huge problem right there, the HIPAA issues. So there are a lot of things that we will have to um, look at and we've, we've worked with. But the, the plus is that at least 130,000 patients' data is there, so the precedent will have been shown and hopefully in seeing that and seeing that we can show outcomes and that we can show benefit, quality, looking at value and things like that, others will um, see that and actually agree. Yeah, so I think that that's a really important point and something that I think we should highlight as we think about how to address some of these issues. And this has come up at other meetings, is the concept of the trusted broker or the safe harbor and what role um, could perhaps the policy shop of genome develop relating to defining those types of safe harbors where we could uh, do this very important job of aggregating data. Well, I think that would be terrific, really important. Um, quick comment on that. In terms of our direct database, the DNA mutation inventory to refine and enhance cancer treatment, you would be surprised about how many uh, barriers there are in terms of getting the mutation status from, for example, trials, from cooperative group trials, et cetera. Originally, we wanted to make that database easily searchable by anyone, but then because groups would give us data that had already been published but had not necessarily been published with the fine mutation uh, data in detail, they didn't want that shareable. So we had to basically make it that you ask us a question, what is your specific mutation of interest, and then we would give the result back. And for example, uh, companies are also very reluctant to share that information, et cetera. It would be good to have an honest broker in the middle that could get all that information. 
I think the other thing that's really interesting, if you actually talk to patients, they're very much for this. So they're the least of the obstacle, you know, in getting this done. And I think it's important in this kind of setting, too, as we go forward and talking about guidelines that patient advocates really be involved because they are our advocates. They want this done. They want quicker therapies and, and all of that. Great idea. Yeah, Jonas, please. Yeah, I was going to ask exactly that. Are um, initiatives like patients like me somehow pushing for this to happen? Patients pushing for the, what we're doing specifically. Yeah. So, um, or initiatives like patients like me, for instance. So yeah, patient, I don't. I don't know that specifically, but I know the patients really, you know, in looking at different surveys and all, have been very willing to do this, and they're not pushing us specifically. But um, I think that they will definitely be great advocates for it because it helps them in the long run. You know, you have metastatic cancer, you're not cured in most situations. So they all know that and are very happy to contribute. And I think we just need to educate people, patients, even more about it and make sure that the you know, data is not used inappropriately. Great. Other comments? Super. Well, this is, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, our our next uh, we topic. Thank our, uh, yes. thank Mark, our we should thank our speakers. Thank you. Mark. Mark reminds me that my manners aren't glued too closely to me, so, <laughs> so he sits next to me instead. Um, so uh, in, in terms of lunch, we had asked them to provide it a little bit early in case we ended early. Um, I don't think they're quite ready yet, uh, but it should be out there momentarily. It will be just to the side here. Um, we are having a working lunch, so really we need you to get your lunch and bring it back in. And with the size of this group, it's going to take the full amount of time to get, get it back in. So we will reconvene here at 110, hearing from the Heart Association. Thank you.